I'd like to welcome you to the service this morning. Even more importantly, however, I would like each of you to join with me in welcoming the Spirit of God to come and take control over every part of this worship event. The most important factor in my life is the consciousness of the presence of the Spirit of God with me. And four times a week or so, I pray along with the psalmist, I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. Afterwards, you receive me into glory. Who have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is a strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's important to me. It's the central thing in my life. And I want to tell you the Lord is present in a special way when his people are gathered together in his name. There's a great shout out in Psalm 100. And I say with the psalmist this morning, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with joyful songs. Know that the Lord, he, it is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates of thanksgiving. Come before his courts with praise, because it gives us the reason that because the Lord is good and his love endures forever, his faithfulness continues through all generations. That's a kind of God that we come to this morning. That's the reason that we're coming to him. Let's pray. God, we've gathered here for a couple of reasons. We've come because you've invited us to come. We've come because we need to come. We need to learn to praise your name. We need to fellowship with your people. We need to receive forgiveness. We need to receive your strength to live life this week with the abundance that you've planned for us. So now fill us with your joy. May we have a great time together as we attempt to practice your will. May we become the people you want us to be and do the things you want us to do. For Jesus' sake, amen. So I've got a handout for you, and it's got three columns. Uh, the title of the message at the top, Stand by Your Man, Your Woman, Everybody. And then there's three columns, and if, you, if I say anything this morning, and hopefully I will, that's worth remembering, write it down, so that you will, in fact, remember it. And uh, if you have any issues or questions, write them down, see me afterwards, we'll talk about them. Or, find some answers for yourself, or the, the third column is the most important one, changes I resolve to make. We, when we come together to worship, uh, the goal is not just to be inspired, or to be amused or entertained, the real goal is that something happen in our hearts that will change us forever, for good, even if it's just for a little bit, that's the goal for today. So anyway, there you are. Fill those out as you, if you wish, and um, it'll help drive home the things that I'm speaking about. We're going to have a scripture reading. We're going to read from chapter Ephesians chapter 5, 21 through 6, 9. If you have your pure Bible, and they're the same as this, that's page 1066. Let's stand as the uh, gospel is read. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior, just as the church is subject to Christ. So also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery. I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, 
and a wife should respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, and singleness of heart, as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters do the same to them. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you are the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Stand by your van, your woman, everybody. You know, some of you older people know that that was taken from Tammy Wynette's great kit from 1968. Those of you who are younger, I mean 40 and under, perhaps maybe never heard of this, but it was a great song. Stand by your van, and it starts out, sometimes it's hard to be a woman, giving all your love to just one man. You'll have the bad times, he'll have the good times, doing things that you don't understand. Sometimes it's hard to be a man, too. She left that part out. Giving all your love to just one woman. Sometimes it's hard to be a husband, giving all your love to just one girl. Nagging and shopping, she'll keep you happy. Your mind's worn out, your head's in a whirl. <laughs> Maybe Nashville isn't ready for me yet. <laughs> but then the chorus and son, stand by your man, give him two arms to cling to and something warm to come to when nights are cold and lonely and as a rousing finish. Show the world you love them. Keep giving all the love that you can. Great advice. Stand by your man. Stand by your woman. How long should we do that? What did we say? Until what? Until death parts us. But here's the thing that I want you to get this morning. We should be like that with everyone. We should commit ourselves to working and serving everybody for their good. Our key verses submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's in 521. And when the Apostle Paul wrote that, he meant one another to include everyone. And here's how you do that. You begin with heaven's help. So that this isn't just a pretense. So that you're not just being polite. But in your heart, you really do have a sense of serving the people around you. Actual, from the heart, unconditional love. And that's really hard. That's hard, to have that kind of love for everybody. There's an essential context to this verse that I didn't read. It's Ephesians 5, 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, you be filled with the Spirit. We all know people who party hardy. That's kind of the background to this. This is better. Speaking in verse 19, speaking to one another as psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make melody from your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. That's the way you behave when you are really filled with the Spirit of God. Your heart is filled with music and with gratitude. You become a different kind of person. You have a different attitude towards life than you just have when you're just living on your own strength. 
Notice especially in verse 20, a characteristic of being filled with the Spirit. We always, always giving thanks to God the Father for, every, for everything. When should we give thanks? Did you get it? I'll read it to you again. Always giving thanks to God. When do we give thanks? Always. always. And then he says, what we give thanks for. What do we give thanks for? Everything. everything. Always giving thanks to God for everything. That ah, seems like a ridiculous thing to people who are outside the faith. Because it seems clear to them things happen in our lives. Circumstances arise. Events happen that we just can't give thanks for. But, for we as believers, this is just rational. Is God really in control over all the circumstances and events in your life? Is He really in control? Does God really intend for only the best, your ultimate good, to come to pass? Does He really intend for the best things to happen to you? Those things are true. Those things are true. You might as well fill your heart with music. Fill your attitude with gratitude. Here's what I think our real lives are like. I heard a story of a man who was cast away and he was on this island and, he, and it was a wretched experience. And all he had was this little lean-to he made out of some branches and a few pieces of things that had drifted out of the wreckage and he had them in this little shack day after day just tending to this little hoard of stuff that he had and he made a little fire and he just kept it going and he was just living a wretched life and then one day he was on the other side of the island and he noticed a great smoke coming over the hill and he went over and he found to his shock that his little Lean to had burned down and had consumed everything that he had in his life. And he sat there with his head in his hands, wretched. And suddenly two men walked up. And he looked at them. They were sailors. He said, where'd you come from? And he said, that ship right there. So how did you find me? He said, we saw your signal fire. We can't always tell. <coughs> The good that comes out of bad things that happen to us. But if we really believe in the providence of God, we really believe that good things actually will come. Now we all know about this truth. I hope we do. But sometimes it's difficult for us anyway, isn't it? We become grouchy, we become depressed, we win become snappish with other people, we're filled with anger, we're filled with rage, we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, the Bible says. How? Here's an image that I really love. Imagine a bottle sitting on a beach. The bottle is beside the ocean. But then imagine somebody coming and taking the bottle and throwing it into the water. So now the bottle is in the ocean. But then imagine someone taking the stopper out of the bottle. Glug, 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 glug. Now the ocean is in the bottle. That's the way we should strive to live. Not so that we are merely surrounded by the Spirit, which is absolutely true, but so that we're filled with the Spirit. His power, His presence are filling us up every day. There's things you can do to make that happen. You can pray, you can read the Bible, you can be around positive people, other believers. But the thing itself, the filling itself is an act of your will. You simply invite Him to come in. I can give you a prayer. Here's a good prayer. Oh God, come in today. 
Come in right now. Fill me right now with your spirit. And he'll answer that prayer. But the prayer isn't essential. What is really essential is that you just do it. You just open yourself up to the spirit and let him come in. It's not just something you do one time. As soon as you realize you've lost his presence, you invite him in again. I think I've told you this before. You hold your hands out. Come on, everybody, put your hands out. <coughs> Just hold your hands out. You're not grasping. You're not hanging on. You're just letting go. You get it? You just let it go. I don't know how often I do this, because I do it now by habit. I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning sometimes, I think, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to get everything done today that I've got on my And I just lay there in the dark. I just give it away. It's been changing my life. And it'll change your life too, if you learn how to do that. <coughs> you can be what you ought to be for everyone in the world by remaining under the power and control and influence of the Spirit of God. Every morning, do it. Every time you think of it, do it. People, this is Zig Ziglar. You like Zig Ziglar? He's a motivational speaker. Zig Ziglar once said, people say motivation doesn't last, but neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it every day. <laughs> I like taking a bath once a day is not an idea. It's not a, a, a Napoleon Hill wrote, any idea, plan, or purpose must be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. You just get in the habit of walking in the spirit. Get to a new attitude for his life and service. Everything changes. Because success in our walk with God and in our relationship with other people is an inside job. Zig Ziglar also wrote, the foundation stones for a balanced success are honesty, character, integrity, faith, love, and loyalty. That's actually the subset of a canonical list. As far as I'm concerned, the Apostle Paul gave in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. That those qualities that come to you when you're filled with the Spirit include love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the things you have in your heart when the Spirit has come in and filled you. And when that happens, when you're walking in the Spirit, when the fruit are becoming part of your life, then you're ready to engage with your spouse. Then you're ready to do verse 21. You're ready to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul is starting in this passage a list of examples of, who, of what he's talking about when he talks about being, uh, being submitted to each other. And he starts with wives. Verse 22, wives submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he's the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives ought to submit to their husbands and everything. This is one of the least favorite verses in the whole Bible <laughs> for a lot of women. And most married ceremonies, then they no longer say love, I will love and honor and obey my husband. The Bible is often annoying. Haven't you found it to be so? It's often annoying because it seems to go overboard with things. How much more palatable would it have been if the Apostle Paul had just written, submit yourself to your own husbands when they are asking you to do what you want or were going to do anyway. <laughs> or submit yourself to your own husbands unless they're being stupid and unreasonable. <laughs> But it says, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. 
If you really are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're going to make your husband the leader of your family to the extent that God Almighty gives you the ability to do so. I think women's liberation is a great thing. It's wonderful. I applaud it. Women really are equal in most ways and usually superior in the best things, social organization, for example, and nurturing and positive models for leadership. These are wonderful things, and most women are certainly better at these than us guys are. We want a caveat for the command. We want some way to moderate it, to get out of it. But here's the thing. But so many people miss. The command becomes possible and even wonderful depending upon the attitude and the behavior of the husband. So bench it to one another out of reverence for Christ means <coughs> the wife is a submit her husband by obedience, but the husband in his turn is to submit himself to his wife in sacrificial love. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And then in verse 28, he elaborates on this. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He loves his wife, loves himself. That's a serious level of loving, isn't it? You take care of your body. You do not intentionally injure your body. You keep it clean. So you take care of your wife. You never do anything to harm her. Body, soul, or spirit. You dedicate yourself to supporting and embracing and making her whole. But verse 25 is a big one. How much did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her. Of course, Paul is talking about the crucifixion. When husbands are filled with the Holy Spirit, they're filled with a willingness to serve their wives to any extent, even down to dying for her. The response of the husband <coughs> to the wife is loving. It's not strong. It's not macho. Paul never said, husbands, you control your wife just as Paul, or just as Christ controls the church. It's not about control. And that's a big problem that men have had in the past with uh, women uh, obeying their husbands. They thought, they imagined that it gave them the right to control their wives. It's, and they made it to be about, in some cases, what they should wear, what their friends should be, how they should conduct themselves in public. They had control over this because the wife was supposed to be in submission to them. And the lust for control extends to abuse and even to murder. Did you know that four times as many women are killed by their spouse as American soldiers are killed by the enemies in all of our current wars? Four times more. And this has to be for those nutcases, the ultimate control over their wives. Just the opposite of what the Bible really means intends for the husband. Because there's an amazing reciprocal work relationship going on in an ideal marriage. The woman treats her husband with unqualified respect and honor, acknowledging him as the leader of the home and the husband uses this honor uses this executive power that the wife is handing over to him to take care of her in every way that he can. He commits himself to doing whatever is good for her they can think of, willing to sacrifice himself to make her happy and joyful. The fruit of the Spirit makes this kind of behavior by husbands and wives possible. You become the kind of person who just naturally but submit yourself to your spouse. Life at this level is brilliant. Marriages are truly stable. My wife Ray is a 
in a perfectly safe married state with me. My wife is an extraordinarily wonderful person and one that's easy to love. But that quality of lovability doesn't figure strongly in my feelings for her. I love her for who she is, of course. I especially love her because of who I am becoming. I love my wife not because of anything she has done, but because of what Christ is doing in my life. That's the way the fruit of the Holy Spirit transforms our relationships. I'm submitting my wife, myself to my wife. I'll do anything to make her happy. Come to the point where I apologize to her for things I don't even feel guilty about. <laughs> you hurt my feelings with that comment, my wife might say. God help me if I ever respond well. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. That's so bad. Do you hear what I'm saying? Who cares whether I meant to hurt my wife's feelings? Ignorance is no better than malice when it comes back to doing other people harm. Even worse is to say, why you never should have gotten <coughs> upset about a thing like that? Now I'm trying to make her responsible for her bad feelings. And what a creep I am. If I ever respond like that, and I've sometimes been that kind of a creep. Ask Ray to tell you. The only response that's appropriate in that situation is to say, I'm so sorry I said that. I'll try never to say anything like that again. Only at that point, if necessary, am I allowed to say, which comment was it that actually made you upset? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we all know if we've been alive for a decade or two that any marriage can become a heaven or a hell. You can ensure its heavenly quality by putting yourself under the control of the Spirit of God, and then on that basis, submit yourself without reservation to your life partner. Did you write anything down? Did I say anything memorable, or I see somebody shaking their head? Well, I'll try to do better here, but we're going to talk about extending that to everyone. I said that the commandment, submit yourself, submit to one another, our reverence to Christ extends to everyone. And in his list of examples, Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul gets two children. Verse six, chapter 6, verse 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You parents might be inclined to engrave, children obey your parents on a copper plaque and put it right over the lintel of the doorway to your kid's room. But notice how parents, for their part, are to submit themselves to their kids to nurture and discipline. Parents do not exhaust, this is verse 4, parents do not exasperate their children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord, your relationship to them is for their birth, is for their help and not your own. I bet there's some of you parents here whose kids might like to engrave parents do not exasperate their children on a copper plaque hanging over the lintel of the doorway into your room. Verses 5 and 6 extend the principle of relations among labor and management. It talks about slaves and masters, but that was just their culture. Today it's not slaves and masters. It's uh, labor management, right? Employees, I just translated this, the Don Huntington Standard Version. Employees, verse 5, employees obey your earthly managers with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not to win their favor when their eye is on you, but through Christ, but as though Christ were your manager and you were carrying out his instructions. Corresponding instructions for employers come in verse 9, and you managers treat your employees in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their hiring manager and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. We could sum all of these things up by saying the required instruction about submitting is always about the golden rule. This is all the golden rules. Kinds of stuff. Unconditional love that we talk about with our mouths but do so poorly with often in our lives. Unconditional love is the golden rule with work gloves on. If you wife were in your husband's shoes, you'd be glad to have a guy love you unconditionally. If you, or if your husband were in your wife's shoes or your parents were in your kids' shoes, 
or you children were in your parents' shoes, or you bosses were in your employees' shoes, or you employees were in your bosses' shoes, in every one of these cases, you would want them to follow Paul's instructions about submitting themselves to the process. Other passages in the Bible apply to the principle of other relationships, submission to enemies. To submit yourself to your enemies, Jesus said. If a man takes your jacket, you give him your sweatshirt. That's an updated version, too. If a man hits you on your left cheek, what do you do? Turn to the right. If a man abuses you, what do you do? You pray for him. You engage in each of these relationships on the basis of what would be best for the person you are relating to and never upon how you can manipulate the relationship for your own good. It's up to you to extend that kind of submission to everyone in your world. And you can live like that. I tell you once more, the Spirit of God will help you to live like that. Every time I go out of the house, I pray, God, make me a blessing to every single person I meet today. And it changes my relationship. The bank tellers, airline attendants, table servers. It changed my relationship to my surgeon who took out half of my colon and to the medical people who waited upon me. I hardly ever get upset with people anymore. I never tell people off. Never get into inappropriate competitions. I've learned the power of serving other people without reservation. Zig Ziglar also wrote a principle that's a big one in motivational uh, speaking and philosophy. It's true, you can have anything in life that you want if you'll just help other people get what they want. That's an interesting <coughs> promise, isn't it? So you give yourself away. You just do it for free. Listen, people. Resolve today that you really are going to stand by your man, stand by your woman, your kids, your parents, your employees, your boss, your enemies. And let's do this together. Okay? Is that a deal? Even if it's just a little bit, let's change ourselves this morning. And on that basis, let's change our marriages, our family life, our working life, our social lives, our purposes in this world. Change them all forever for good. Today, let's be good for ourselves, good for others, and good for heaven's sake. God bless you all.